Okay, so there's two men, and they go into the temple to pray. Let me take you back to a world of temples, of gods and goddesses, of slavery and indebtedness. The dark room would have filled with swirls of smoke that caressed the cheeks of the most godly saints and priests of the time. The smell of incense would have done little to mask, merely to mingle, with the smell of both fresh and rotting animal carcasses that would have been used in various rituals and trials. The purpose of the sacrificial system at the time was simple. The straight and narrow for most religions was basically the same. You offered something valuable to the gods and got something valuable in return. For some faiths, this was protection, blessing, rain, a good harvest. But for others, for other faiths, it was more profound. Access. Purification. Holiness. These are not cheap commodities that could be easily attained. Even if you did offer your yearly sacrifice, there was more that was needed to be grafted into this type of space. You needed good moral conduct, a clean moral record, an upstanding, irreproachable sense of justice and integrity. You needed righteousness. This was the case for one of the men who went into the temple that day. He was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jewish people, a man who had devoted his entire life to knowing, to understanding, to memorizing the very words of the God of the universe. If there was ever a man who had a moral and upstanding sense about him, it was this guy, the Pharisee. He walked into the temple that day and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And as those words left his mouth, his finger came down like a guillotine onto the heart of the second man. The second man was a tax collector, a traitor to the Jewish people, a man who had devoted his entire life to get-rich-quick schemes, libel, extortion, treason, and likely much much worse. If there ever was a man who would be condemned by the God of Jacob, it was him. He walked into the temple that day, and he prayed, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. And he beat his chest in the overwhelming agony of his repentance. And as scandalous as it sounds, when these two men left the presence of God that day, one left justified and the other one left condemned. Now, you might think that it was the man who devoted his entire life to understanding the very words of God that would be the one justified. But of course, then you would be wrong. Bible Nuts, thanks so much for exploring with us today. In this episode of Bible Unbound, we are exploring this strange and sticky concept of, you know, basically how you know you're saved. <laughs> okay, kind of. This is largely addressed in the last six epistles of the New Testament. Now, I need to say up front here that there were several versions of this episode that were originally outlined because we could have finished out the year here in lots of different ways. But as I kept thinking about it, and as I kept diving deeper, the more I realized how Peter's epistles and John's epistles and Jude, they're, they're all tackling the same basic problem and they all use the same basic argument to win over their audience, which is this. Their audience, the listeners, they have become 
the perfected Israelite nation. Now, at the risk of becoming decontextualized, what I'm not saying is that the church replaces the nation of Israel. And what I'm not saying is that the Israelite nation has no role to play in the redemptive narrative of the scriptures. What I'm saying is this, Israel was called to be the representative of God that Adam could not be. But Israel, Israel couldn't live up to this expectation. And so over and over again, we see this nation fail to be a good representative of God, let alone the perfect representative of God. And so the prophet Isaiah prophesies these two types of Israels. There's one Israel that rejects God over and over and over again. And then there's another Israel that trusts God. That's the servant of God. That's the slain lamb of God. Because you see, the type of Israel that trusts in God incurs this deep and unrelenting suffering, according to Isaiah. And then there's Jesus. And Jesus comes and he fills the role of this perfected Israelite. He comes and he fills the role of this perfected representative of God. Well, now, as we'll see today, the Gentiles are grafted into that expanding narrative. You know, if you go back and you listen to all like 49 episodes of this podcast and then watch the Paul video, I mean, this would all make a lot of sense. But since I imagine you don't have time to do that if you haven't already... And, you know, that's the basic idea. Adam was supposed to be a representative. He wasn't a good representative. Israel was supposed to be a representative. They weren't good representatives. Jesus was a representative. He was a good representative. And now the church. Israel is this archetype for a person who is God's representative. That, that person who, who represents God suffers deeply. And the church is called to be that in many, many ways. Okay, so now that that's out of the way... Imagine with me, if you will, that there's this group of Gentile churches whose members have all been converted to Christianity back in the first century. These members, they want to learn more about this Jewish Messiah, and since they're not Jewish, they begin to read and to interpret the Jewish Bible, or what you and I would call the Old Testament, most likely. But as they're reading, they see time and time and time again that the heroes of the Old Testament, I mean, things go well for them. But... Since they've converted to Christianity, things could not be going worse. I mean, their family members are being taken and imprisoned in the middle of the night. Their their best friend would have been beheaded for what they believe. Rumor has it the Roman government is after them too. Couldn't be worse. So enter the last handful of epistles in the back of your Bible. A handful of letters sent by Christianity's top leaders as encouragements to churches who who have been dealing with, with two huge things. Persecution and false teaching. (laughs) Imagine that. It's like we haven't ever talked about it before. Peter's letters are mysteriously addressed to a group called the elect exiles in the dispersion. Scholars think that this refers to mostly or strictly Gentile believers that have been scattered throughout Asia Minor, maybe even Northern Africa. He's writing to encourage and to exhort these believers to hold fast to their faith in the midst of oppression by reminding them that that they have been grafted into this grand narrative of Israel's redemptive history. He opens his letter by reminding his audience that they have been given this imperishable inheritance. Namely, that which we've talked about in the Old Testament, this unadulterated access to the God of the universe in spite of their sinfulness. He reminds them that because of this reality, there is real reason to rejoice even on the worst of days. He tells them that their suffering is no longer purposeless, but but rather it's refining them like, like gold in this really hot fire. Peter uses this Old Testament illusion of fire, which is a classic example of testing and suffering, because they would have seen that example in Abraham, in Moses, in David, and in the prophets. The prophets. They didn't have it easy either, Peter says. He goes on by saying that the suffering of the prophets was for the direct purpose of giving these Gentile converts, these Gentile sinful believers, the good news of their reconciliation to the Godhead. If the suffering of the prophets in the Old Testament pointed people to Christ, then the suffering of these Gentile believers is pointing others and even themselves back to Christ, Peter says. This is such good news, he adds, 
that the angels themselves long for this kind of relationship with God. Because of this, Peter then exhorts them not to give in to their selfish urges that cause division and sin. Not because if they do give in to their selfish urges that their inheritance will be taken away from them, but, but rather because of the great gift that they've been given. Not giving in to such temptations will allow them to approach God with confidence, undefiled, and blameless. And then from here, Peter lists several ways in which the Gentiles can live out their new justification. One of these ways is being willing to be submissive to those who are in authority over you. And the idea here is, is that if these Christians can submit to earthly authorities, then they will have an easier time submitting to heavenly authority when God asks them to do hard things. He exhorts them to be patient in their suffering because, as he's already alluded to, their suffering will eventually and inevitably glorify God. And so then Peter closes out his letter with this image of the final glorification of God, reminding them that they've been entered into this grand narrative of salvation that was started in the Garden of Eden. That, like how Jesus suffered like the Israelites in exile but was without sin, so they too, being without sin, are given the same inheritance of their Christ, namely, suffering and death. But suffering is not the end of the story. And Peter goes on to remind them of the final day of judgment and reconciliation where Christ will return and make all things new again. And like the Israelites, the churches are now set in hope towards this final day of reconciliation. Now, when Peter pens his second letter, it would have been several years later, Peter would be in Rome at the time, and he's writing to all these churches as he's nearing the end of his life. I mean, his death sentence is on the doorstep. It's coming soon. And there's a group of false teachers that have gone out and begun teaching Christian churches that are things other than the gospel message. So, Peter writes his second letter to remind this same group of Christians, most likely, of Christ's divinity while still using the idea of these Gentiles becoming the perfected representatives of God. You see, he reminds them that they've received Christ's inheritance, and since Jesus was the perfect Israelite, then they too are to be grafted into that same framework of thinking, that same paradigm, taking on the characteristics and attributes of God himself. And I, Austin, I am adding here that this is not by their work, but because of the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, as we're going to see. You see, Peter lists these seven attributes that God has and that are being mapped onto this group of people through the work of the Holy Spirit. These seven attributes, Peter is saying, is the most telling marker as to whether the teacher in front of them is a true teacher or not. He says, and this is my own translation, he says that the faith that they have received in Jesus Christ will inevitably be supplemented with virtue, and then virtue with knowledge, and then knowledge with self-control, and then self-control with steadfastness. And steadfastness will eventually give way to godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and then brotherly affection with love. Peter says that the most telling and final attribute of whether or not the teacher in front of you has the Holy Spirit and is sharing gospel-centered scriptural teaching is love. Not right doctrine, not knowledge, not a perfect record, but love. And then Peter very clearly lays out who he is in light of this reality, who Jesus is and what Jesus accomplished, and again, what he will do again at his second coming. Again, all of this is to push back against false teachings and to give a robust kind of litmus test to the hearers of how to discern easily false teachers. Peter then moves on to giving some Old Testament examples of rebellions, you know, like those found in Genesis 6 with the sons of God or in Gomorrah. And he's doing this to remind his audience that false teachers will not have the ability to build their, you know, faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love because these false teachers will exhibit the same characteristics as the characters that are in rebellion against God throughout the scriptures. They will be greedy. They will be selfish. They will be sensual, money, power-driven people. And then Peter ends his letter again by reminding the Gentile believers of the second coming of Christ 
and how this will, with finality and judgment, eliminate the need to test the teachers at all because God will eradicate evil from a fallen world and his people will dwell with him securely. Peter then encourages them not to become discouraged because God hasn't returned yet, and instead he implores his audience to dwell on on the complex nature of God's breathing existence into creation and how everything can change at any moment. And yet, human time will always be more short-sighted than God's timing. And from there, Peter's letter draws to a close. Now, here's the thing. John's letters... They do the exact same thing with the exact same concerns as Peter, but in a more like poetic and nuanced way. It's crazy. It's like they know each other or something. <laughs> For that reason, I'm going to quick run through John's epistles, but if I don't do it this way, then it would be all awkward because I would just be saying the exact same things the next week, and then we wouldn't get to go over Revelation together. So I figured this is the easiest way. <laughs> It also means that there's likely going to be some humming noises in the background. I'm sorry, I just have limited control over it. So, okay, John is communicating the same theological truths, but in a different tone and fashion as Peter. He's concerned over a group of false teachers that have left the church, the church with a big C, not like his personal church, and they've been preaching all over that Jesus could not have been the Messiah and that it's all a big hoax. So John, who fervently believes that it's not a big hoax and that Jesus is the Messiah, is addressing these churches who have all but descended into chaos because of this. In all three of John's letters, and they get shorter and more urgent as they go on, John is exhorting these churches to be united together because they've been called to be, you guessed it, the perfected Israel the perfected representative of God. And since Israel was called to be a unified nation and then split, John here is lamenting the fact that since the church can't split apart because it is the Messiah's church, then those that are actively trying to destroy the church are actually not in the fold at all of this perfected representative body. And the best way to fight against false teaching, according to John, is a unified set of beliefs and ideas that create a cohesive narrative from which the story of redemption comes. He laments the fact that churches have become divided and have started quarreling with one another. But his advice is, I mean, it's quite practical. Unification of the understanding of what Jesus did will allow people to enter in and to push back against false teachers. I mean, just imagine a world in which the broken body of Christ came together as this unified people and said, um, no, that's not what Jesus did. And then everyone just, like, agreed. I mean, that's the kind of world John longs to see and he paints for us in his letters. And, you know, I'm just going to throw this in there at the end. Go read it. That's what Jude is about, too. <laughs> but at that, the final epistles of the New Testament, they fade out. Okay, so I guess there's not a ton left to be said at the end of this episode, other than the biblical epic makes a ton of sense when you read it as a unified whole, looking out for just one theme instead of trying to get every possible ounce of theology out of every single word. You see, the language that Peter uses to open up his epistles to a group of Gentile believers is honestly staggering, as he paints for them a world in which an undeserving group of people receive an inheritance from a man that is not of their national or religious origin. So I come back again to the opening parable of this episode. The gospel imagines a world in which we see ourselves in both of the characters that walk into the temple that day. 
On the one hand, we stand akimbo, proud at the accomplishments that we've racked up over the years of our life. Some of us are good at, I don't know, fasting. Some of us are good at praying, good at welcoming and serving, tithing, giving. But at the end of the day, all of our good deeds, every good deed we've ever mustered up, is just dirty rags before the God of the universe. And so immediately we find ourselves as a tax collector, as a man or a woman who, who has a trash heap of sinful garbage behind us. I mean, I have ruined relationships that I was proud of. Ruined the chances of someone else's success. I have misinterpreted and misunderstood and misrepresented God throughout my life. I am a traitor to him and his people. And so then this is where the line is drawn. We are ripped from our dais of perfection and thrown onto the ground at Jesus' cross. We look up and we see what he's done for us, and we beat our chest and cry out for forgiveness, and he's faithful and he's just to do that. Or, they are at Jesus' feet, we look to our right and we look to our left, and we look up and we say, God, well I thank you I'm not like that man, crucified, died, and buried in his own sin. And then we walk away on realizing the encounter we had there. You see, the point of Peter in John's letter is not to argue with ourselves or with others about who is in or who is out or who is false or who is true. I mean, if we did that, it would make us Isaiah's second portrait of Israel, broken, divided, and lamenting. Instead, Peter and John point a mirror directly back at us and inwardly and ask us to reflect on our own reflection of the Godhead. You see, being a false teacher is not about being a perfect human being. It's about accepting, and to some degree understanding, what Jesus has done for you. And if that leads to division, if that leads to anger, self-righteousness, then maybe you ought to rethink the encounter that you had with Jesus. If, however, it leads to repentance, to love, to brotherly affection, to godliness, then no matter what you face in life, come hell or high water, you know that your anchor is secured in the person and work of Christ. You know, to say it another way, and I'll, I'll just end with this, to discern a false teacher is not to discern whether or not the doctrines they preach are agreeable to you or even good and sound and perfect. To discern whether a teacher is false, according to the New Testament, is to discern whether or not the teacher is preaching the gospel. That sinners, like you and I, are freely reconciled to the Godhead. And I think we get all warm and fuzzy about this, and we think, like, can a murderer be reconciled to the Godhead? What about an adulterer? What about someone who has committed injustices? What about someone who disagrees with you politically? And you might say, yeah, 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 uh, an adulterer can be reconciled to the Godhead once they repent, and they never do it again. But the scandal of the gospel is not that. It is that we are free from our sins, past, present, and future, and are reconciled to the Godhead. That's the good news. That there is no more striving in, in our own strength to never sin again after we become Christians. Just let that reality sit in for a moment that sinful human beings are Christians. That the teacher that's in front of you on any given Sunday or otherwise is not perfect. They're a traitor. They're an extortioner. They're an adulterer in a spiritual or a literal sense. And the good news of Jesus Christ is that he reconciles those people back to the Godhead anyway. And the true teacher understands this reality deeply. And that is exactly why 
They're so passionate about sharing it with you because their faith has led to knowledge, which has led to love, not that they have a clean record. And that should be good news for you too. (laughs) If the teacher is preaching the gospel, then they're a true teacher. If they're not preaching the gospel, then they're not. They're a false teacher. And, and we can learn from these figures, whether teachers or not as well, because we can see ourselves being shaped and transformed by the gospel. And that is very, very good news. This was Bible Unbound. We'll see you next time. 